and welcome to episode 199 of Zalagamoto, the pent ultimate episode before the channel hits the big 2004 reviews. And I can't be prouder of that, and more happy that all of you out there have been watching and supporting me for the last four and a half years. But let's put a pin in that for next week, because this isn't episode 200, it's 199. For this episode though, I was in a bit of a quandary when I was trying to plan it out. The game that I was hoping to review, Winter Olympics for the Master System, well, apparently it took a left turn at Albuquerque, or more specifically, Litchfield, Staffordshire. However, thankfully, it looks like Hermes didn't lose my package completely, and it'll actually arrive this week, which is nice. I'm always happy to get one more game in the collection, especially when it seems like more and more, the rest of the games that I still need are just stupidly expensive. This doesn't help me for this week's video though, and I still needed to figure out what game I should review. I'd mentioned in the end of last week's video that I was considering possibly doing a review of one of the older Sega CD titles that I have that's from their original cardboard box era. Just to mix things up a bit, as I've only reviewed one other game for the Sega CD this year. But I hadn't decided on which game that I was going to do yet, and thankfully I've actually got a few to choose from. This is when I became grateful for all the support that I've had for the channel over the last four and a half years, not just from other viewers out there, but also from ch fellow channel owners that have greatly helped me get the Zalagamoto name out there and to get things to where they are today. One of those channel owners is Dudley from the Fantastic Gaster Zine, and you should totally go check him out if you're not already familiar with his work. But in his latest episode of Yesterzine, a good portion of the video was dedicated to the Lotus series of games on the Amiga, which we partially got here in the US on the Genesis in the form of Lotus Turbo Challenge and Lotus 2, and then also in a derivative fashion on the Super Nintendo as the Top Gear series from Kemco. Now, this is where you might be scratching your head a bit, as I said I wanted to pick out a Sega CD cardboard box title to review, and clearly none of those games I just mentioned are Sega CD games. However, there is one game for the Sega CD that definitely shares more than a passing resemblance with the Lotus series, and that's another game that's based on a specific vehicle, and that is Jaguar XJ220, which was originally released for the Amiga, just like the Lotus series, before having its Sega slash Mega CD version hit the market in March of 1993. Jaguar XJ220 isn't officially part of the Lotus Top Gear family as it was developed by Core Design rather than Gremlin Interactive. However, it should be noted that both Lotus and Jaguar are historically associated with England from a manufacturing and ownership perspective, and both Gremlin Interactive and Core Design were British design houses, with Gremlin being based in Sheffield and Core Design being from Derby, only about 50 miles or so from one another via the A38 and M1 highways. And this episode has quickly become far too British. Uh, anyway, however, I won't try to pull off an accent here because that would be even more horrific than King Charles' sausage fingers. Okay, this has gone too far. Let's get to the package and hopefully get you some eye bleach for that last picture. And this is my copy of Jaguar XJ220 for the Sega CD, and it is in fantastic shape, if I do say so myself. More often than not, if you actually come across one of these first 22 releases for the Sega CD, if you can find one with the box, usually it's beat all to hell. They really weren't designed with structural integrity in mind, and have a lot more in common with the very early Electronic Arts games for the Genesis, where the manual would slide in the back, and then there was this specific pocket for the cartridge. But in this case, that's what's used for the jewel case. And the problem with that design is that they're very prone to crushing, especially if you don't have the jewel case in the box to give it some stability. I got very lucky with finding Jaguar XJ220, Prince of Persia, and Night Trap, all in this similar well-preserved condition about a year ago from a local disc replay. And they also had a copy of Hook, but I already had that, so I left it for someone else. It was probably the easiest sale that they had that day. As soon as I saw them in that glass case, I immediately jumped on it, because I knew I wasn't going to see them together in that kind of condition again. 
And yes, if you want to get technical, this copy isn't perfect or anything. You can see a little bit of crushing on the sides that I was referring to, and there are a few nicks here and there on the cover, but I'm very happy with it. And they didn't cost me an arm and a leg either. I think I got all three of these for under $200. As far as the cover art goes, nothing overly special here, and honestly, it's a little underwhelming. Basically, it's just the Jaguar and the XJ220 logo at the top, and then a picture of the car itself on a solid background. I definitely prefer both the art used on the European and Korean versions of the game, and interestingly enough, Japan apparently couldn't decide between the two, and it got a lenticular cover that alternates between the European and Korean art. What I'm saying here is that the US got screwed on this one, but it is the most authentic to the original Amiga version, so I guess there's that. Flipping over the back, and this is at least a solid layout. I like having the bright yellow on the dark background, as it really makes things pop. But the screenshot captions could have been a little bolder, like the flavor text is in the middle. As far as that text goes, it's great, and does an excellent job with bullet points, selling the main features of the game, and all the captions are pretty nice as well, doing a good job of subtly selling the game. For instance, this one. From Australia to Egypt, guide your team through 16 of the most heinous race courses on the planet. Excellent. Inside the box, we've got the disc and manual, and the manual's in great shape, just like the box. The manual itself is solid and does an excellent job of explaining the game with lots of screenshots and diagrams. I particularly found page 6 helpful, as the options screen isn't exactly intuitive. I mean, once you know what the different options are for, they make sense, but the first time you look at them, you're probably going to be scratching your head for a bit. Then further on are nice explanations of both the Grand Prix and World Tour modes, and finally a write-up on how to use the track creation mode before closing with a list of 10 different cars that are used in the game. Well, with fake names anyway, because the only car actually licensed in the game is the XJ220. But if you look closely, you might be able to figure out what the real-life cars are that your opponents are modeled after. Okay, that's the package for Jaguar XJ220. Let's get to the game and see how well the Sega CD works for a racing game. In 2023, it probably seems odd that racing games only featured either a specific car, or maybe a handful, as the case was in Lotus 2 for the Genesis, that featured three different models of Lotus. Er, Loti? Did Dudley already make that joke? Anyway, in the early 90s, licensing was a totally different thing than it is now, as it was in the very early days of that sort of thing, and companies hadn't necessarily figured out how these types of agreements would work, how much to charge, pay, etc. Just think of early sports games on the Genesis, where you might have one particular athlete sell their rights to appear in the game, but the rest of the rosters are filled with nameless players on unnamed teams. Well, cars are no different, and it really took until Electronic Arts released the first Need for Speed game under the Road and Track magazine banner a year after Jaguar XJ220 in 1994 before video game publishers and car manufacturers, for that matter, realized how just a big a deal that video games that featured real-life cars could be. Hence why games like Lotus and the Test Drive series existed, that featured only a limited number of real-life named cars. But what is the Jaguar XJ220, and why did Core Design think it was an important enough car to design a video game around? And while you're probably familiar with the brand name of Jaguar, you may not be familiar with the specific model of the XJ220. Hell, I, I like cars, and I've certainly played my share of driving games with real cars, but honestly, the XJ220 is the only model of Jaguar I can name, and it's only because of this game. Now, granted, a lot of that is because Jaguars simply aren't common in the United States, and usually when you see an exotic luxury sports car around here, it's either Italian or German. Well, the reason why the XJ220 was special is actually pretty simple. Speed. After ripping out the original 500 horsepower V12 Jaguar engine from the concept version of the XJ220, the newly twin-turbo V6 production model was able to tilt the scales at 550 horsepower and for a brief period of time around the release of the game, the XJ220 became the fastest production car on Earth, testing at 212.3 miles per hour on the test track. So, who wouldn't want to play a game where you get to race in what's literally the fastest car in the world at the time? As far as the actual game is concerned, Jaguar XJ220 has four different modes. Grand Prix, World Tour, 
practice in Track Editor. Grand Prix and World Tour is probably where you will spend the majority of your time, as both modes consist of 16 different races to try to make your way through. And to be clear, each of the 16 races in both modes are different, giving the game a total of 32 races out of the box to compete in. You might be asking then, well, what is the difference between Grand Prix and World Tour mode, other than the tracks? Well, at a base level, that is pretty much all that's different between the two, but there is one, well, I wouldn't say big difference between the two, but it is significant, and I'll get to that in a minute. In both Grand Prix and World Tour mode, you're competing for Team Jaguar in an effort to win both the Season Individual Championship and the Constructors' Championship. The Constructors' Championship might be a foreign concept to you if you primarily watch American racing series like NASCAR, but it's actually pretty simple. Both racing series are made up of 20 competitors, including yourself and a friend if you're playing in two-player mode. And each of those 20 competitors are driving one of 10 different brands of cars. So you end up with 10 different teams that are trying to win a championship for the manufacturer of the car, hence the name Constructors' Championship. The higher position you finish a race in, the more points you get and prize money you earn. It's pretty obvious why earning season points after each race is important, but ending up in the money has its own purpose, and it's not for becoming rich and famous. In Jaguar XJ220, your vehicles are not indestructible, despite how you might choose to race around the track. As you progress through the series, some parts will be damaged by your driving, and some will just wear out over time. Either way, you'll need to make sure that you're earning enough money to cover the repairs, because if some parts of your car are critically damaged after a race, and you can't afford the repair, it's time to reload or restart. Repairs are a part of the game whether you choose Grand Prix or World Tour, but World Tour mode throws another wrench in the works. Pun fully intended. World Tour mode is exactly as it's described, with the series consisting of 16 tracks from countries all over the world. Rather than have to race through the tracks in a specific order like in Grand Prix mode, you now have the option to pick which country you visit when. Want to race in the United States, then China, and then have race number three be in Brazil? You can totally do that assuming you can afford the bill. See, now, not only do you have to win enough prize money to cover the repairs to your car, you also have to be able to pay for your transportation between the countries to make it to the next race. To assist you in your travels, you're given an accountant who will tell you what the next cheapest destination is, after you've already picked a track, but you can then either go back and take his recommendation or stick to your original choice, knowing that it will be a little more expensive. I don't really know how to feel about this, I like where Core's head was at with this alternative to Grand Prix mode, but I've got a feeling that most of the time people are just going to choose the cheapest pass through as to not risk going bankrupt. Speaking of liking where Core's head was at, there's nothing I like better than a racing game that has a season mode where points are tracked with the goal of being to have the best overall performance and win a championship. Having that mode in a racing game is going to immediately get my attention and Jaguar XJ220 did it twice. There's just one problem. To score lots of points in a racing series, you need to routinely finish near the top of the field. And I'm sure your response to that statement is, well, duh. But what happens when you can't consistently win or podium in events? This is unfortunately where Jaguar XJ220 falls apart. The game is difficult. I spent a few hours playing it for the review, and while I definitely got better at the game over that time period, the best I was ever able to finish in a race was third, and I was only ever able to do that once. Almost every race I competed, I finished between fourth and sixth place, and I don't believe I ever qualified better than tenth. The game doesn't keep track of total race time, so I would never know exactly how far off the pace I was. But the fact that I only ever saw the second place car once the entire time I played the game should tell you something. And the worst part is, the game is pretty simple, so it's not like there was much else for me to learn. I suppose maybe I could have tried to memorize the courses, or possibly drive using a manual transmission instead of an automatic, but I don't know how much either of those would really help. What certainly would have helped, but wasn't included, would be an on-screen map, showing you where you are on the track, so that you would possibly be able to preemptively brake, rather than skidding around a turn, and only hitting the brake to avoid going off the track if necessary. Which is really your only option, as many turns don't require braking specifically, and braking on every turn will hurt your speed too much. Graphically speaking, the game is pretty great. 
When Core ported the game to the Sega CD, they elected to use the sprite scaling capabilities of the Sega CD hardware, and as a result, Jaguar XJ220 resembles some of the great Sega Super Scaler based arcade games like our OutRun and Super Hang On. To a point, anyway, as the game is still limited to the Genesis 64 on color screen limitation, and even with the built in sprite scaling hardware of the console, when a few different cars are on the screen at one time, the frame rate will consistently dip as the hardware tries to keep up with everything that's going on. Those are minor quibbles though, and just the fact that the game is playing on a console that finally felt like an experience from a much more expensive arcade cabinet is something to be celebrated. Also, the game has other nice touches like varying backgrounds and track art depending on the locale, and weather effects like rain and snow that pop up occasionally and that not only keep things interesting, but are also aesthetically pleasing in ways that few other games of the era can claim. Fans of the Amiga original should note that the game does look a bit different on the Sega CD, with primarily the various car sprites being redrawn, but from my perspective it's an improvement, it just may take a few races to get used to. The sound in Jaguar XJ220 is nice as well, as you would probably expect with it being a CD based game. Before each race, you pick which of the six background music tracks you'd like to play during the race via a graphical representation of a car CD player. This I like and dislike at the same time. I think it's a nice touch and it's fine for the sound test screen, but the screen has a few different buttons to click on and takes a bit of getting used to to figure out what you're supposed to be doing. In this case, I think less probably would have been more, but once you get used to it, it's fine. And the actual music tracks are all solid and provide some good tunes while you're racing around the track. From an effects perspective, the engine noise goes up and down in pitch as you accelerate and decelerate, and there's of course the standard screech of tires and turns to let you know when you're sliding out, but other than that, there's really not much to write home about. Rating Jaguar XJ220 is difficult, because there's a definite mix of things that I really really like about the game and that I'm impressed with, but it's spoiled by a pretty major issue in the difficulty. One of the best things I can say about the game comes from when I gave World Tour Mode a try. As I went to play the game, I made sure to set the lap length to 5 laps, so that you'd have to stop for a pit stop at least once during a race to give it a more realistic feel. As a side note, you can set the race lengths to 3 laps, which are short enough to not require pit stops, 5, 7, or even 9 laps if you really want a lengthy affair. With that length set to 5 laps, and with the qualifying lap and the disc load times, which aren't terrible considering the single speed drive of a Sega CD, you end up with each race taking about 10 minutes or so. I was playing World Tour mode fairly late at night, but I enjoyed the racing so much that I ended up going through a little more than half of World Tour mode in one shot. And in each of those last three races or so, I kept thinking, just one more race, maybe this time I'll do better. Even though it was well after midnight at that point. Ultimately, I think I ended up getting frustrated with one particular track that had a corner in it that was so sharp that if you got stuck in it, you weren't getting out without significant damage to the car, and more importantly, time lost as the race leaders got further and further ahead. And this is where I get critical of the difficulty. Had this track been an aberration, and had it been easier to finish in a better position in the other tracks, or gasp, maybe actually win a race, then I would have been okay with it. Hey, you can't win them all, right? But instead, this track crushed any hopes I had of being competitive, and as good as the game is on technical merit and the nice features it has like two-player mode or the custom track creation, which I hadn't even really mentioned, it's kind of hard for me to enjoy a game that doesn't appear to be winnable without resorting to cheating. And maybe that's on me, maybe I just need to get good, but as it stands, I'm giving Jaguar XJ220 3 stars on technical merit alone, which is probably a star higher than it should get, but it really does excel at everything except possibly the most important category for a video game, being fun. Okay, and that was Jaguar XJ220 for the Sega CD. When I first started playing this game, I had high hopes. I've always enjoyed the Lotus Top Gear series of games to the point of the Top Gear games being some of my favorites in the entire Super Nintendo library. And I know that Jaguar XJ220 is not part of those series, so maybe that comparison isn't quite fair, but ever since I first saw this game, I was thinking that it could possibly be one of the best racing games of the 16-bit era with the power of the Sega CD at its disposal. 
Unfortunately, it just doesn't quite get there for me. But if you like racing games and if you don't mind a challenge, I definitely recommend giving Jaguar XJ220 a look, especially if you have something like an EverDrive that would allow you to play it without all the loading times. Next time on Zalagamoto, it's the big episode 200. Yep, I'll have officially completed 200 reviews in this crazy quest to play and review them all. And for episode 200, it's got to be a big game. So no, that copy of Winter Olympics for the Master System that finally came in from Europe this week, I'll, I'll deal with that eventual disappointment later. No, next week it's a game that I think might redefine the scale of how I review video games. It's that good. Or at least it was when I first played it 30 years ago. I guess we'll just have to see how well it's held up. Well, that's it for Zaligan Moto episode 199. If you like what you saw here and want to see more, please think about liking and subscribing if you are so inclined, as it will help more people see these videos. But most importantly, whatever you like to play, have fun, and be excellent to each other. Later!